I am technically here. <laughs> I don't know why. <laughs> I have so little to offer today in terms of brain power. I will do my darndest anyway. Oh, True Omen wants to be on stage. What's up? What's up, Omen? Hello. Speaking of somebody who is not at 100%, are you, are you feeling better today, man? Oh, yeah. 100%. Much yeah. better. Well, you see, everywhere I go, I do the networking. And mm -hmm. uh, I've made friends with some people whose friends are working for some local outsourcing studios. That's right. And uh, they've seen my portfolio and said, oh, maybe you could go to these guys. Mm -hmm. And I can see if I do like a couple of personal projects within a couple months, I can give it a shot feel good and at the moment they have some gigs as well oh so my god I we won't. just we just got gifted a t2 sub here thank you so much uh half moon owl i don't think we've gotten a t2 sub before this is awesome thank you so much so you well, to fill people in on the lore you were just fired <laughs> you just got oh yeah shit canned a thing that i have oh. always enjoyed i've always loved when i get fired um, I don't think I've ever gotten fired and been like, oh, I'm so bummed. Like every time I've been fired, I've been like, oh, thank God. And, but you, but you came in and you were feeling pretty down yesterday. Yeah. Well, my position is also like, uh, you're a fresh stable, graduate, you know, I can't, I, can, I can't get back uh, to, uh, to home to live with my parents. Exactly. You know, it's, it's a tricky, unique situation, but mm -hmm. nevertheless, I got fired from uh, not just from any studio, but like from big corporations. So it's like hundreds and hundreds of employees. Like, They're like, uh, we're going to take these hundreds of people, but you? No. Yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> You're not. But uh, the thing is, today I've uh, I've asked for my for uh, the lead artist of my department uh -huh. and for his uh, subsidiary. You know, the guy who who like acts in his stead when he's oh, gone. Thank, thanks for the raid, um, Sculptor. Uh, very kind of you. Bring your people along. Hey. And uh, I just wanted, I just wanted to know the reason, like why, because uh, I, I was a <laughs> trainee. I had a position of trainee yeah, and yeah, yeah. I've been under- uh, You're like, the... I'm good at being a trainee. How dare you? <laughs> I was well, amazing. It, it I was the best trainee you guys have ever had the opportunity to be able to train. Perhaps, perhaps. But perhaps. at least uh, nobody nobody gave me the um, uh, the feel that uh, I was failing at my training. In fact, I was. So I had the two guys that were training me, uh -huh. uh, the actual artists in the department, and both of them had uh, nothing uh, but good things to say to me uh, uh, about me. You know about the work that I do. I've been filling out all the estimates and uh, fitting into the time schedule and everything. And the lead artist uh, for, especially in the past two weeks, I've been working for only just a month before they booted me. And this is, and so, again, to fill people on the lore, you this was your first job. This was your first professional yeah. art job. For, first official, like uh, first big studio job. I've been doing lots of uh, commissions and stuff. Uh, C c commissions and uh, the yeah basic commissions but uh, so the, the the art lead was absent in those past two weeks because he was on his uh, uh, how do you call it vacation uh -huh. so he had no way of monitoring anything so basically two teachers that I had the actual artists who worked with me and monitored all my stuff that I was doing for the studio they were the only ones who could basically give a feedback about me as an employee. Which is useful because so, now you know hold, who to hold a grudge against. Yes, but uh, today, the first thing is first today, mm -hmm. when I uh, get to work because I had to do all my walking papers and stuff, mm -hmm. I came up to both of my uh, artist, uh, artists who were training me and uh, basically told them, yo man, I'm fired and their actions uh, and their uh, emotion like reaction was basically that of a surprise or more of uh, of a shock 
because apparently that never happened before. Oh, <laughs> wow, you really were potentially rousing the suspicion of people who are maybe worried you'd be too attractive to their wives. Perhaps. Uh, when I got, last time I got fired, I remember I was walking out of there with my box of stuff and my boss's boss shouted out to me. He goes, hey, still on for that meeting at three o'clock? And I went, nope, I'm fired. And he went, by who? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, it, it was a little bit different this time around at least. So ask them what they told uh, to the the higher ups uh -huh. about me, and they basically said that uh, I'm doing fine for a trainee. So basically, and there were other trainees with me who started earlier than I did, like basically months and months earlier. We had uh, they had a three month program of trainees. So you basically fail three months, and by the end of the third month, you're supposed to fit like perfectly into the studio life. You know. Yeah. Just do your stuff, meet the deadlines, estimates, all, all stuff like that. And we had, uh, they had like. Don't be um, so intimidatingly attractive that the your bosses need to fire you to protect them their own ego. Oh, I'm sure of that much because, uh, yeah. so, in the re revelation of that, I pulled uh, all of my uh, so. The lead, uh, the, uh, the lead uh, department artist who basically just came back from his vacation and the first things first he uh, fires me like how he he, d he didn't even told uh, my uh, 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 the trainers the artist who trained me that I'm fired oh didn't interesting know about that do you think it was yeah. a power move on his part like he was like who the fuck hired this guy while I was on vacation get him out of here I think it was more of a political move because I'm not exactly the uh, Russian citizen and there were uh, tons of paper problems with that because it all must be official you know like the official pay the official this that so I had to put all my legal papers in the meat grinder and that postponed my uh, well my being there in the studio for about like couple weeks and uh, it really pissed him off apparently <laughs> <laughs> has absolutely nothing to do with your drawing ability or who you are or how sexy you are or anything it's just like it's not. paperwork and, uh, so, and so i was asking so so i was asking like uh, tell me the exact uh, uh, examples of the work that i've been failing at because uh, i have lots of work by that time and there are lots of other like uh, seniors that basically look at my work and they approve it and it goes into the like we don't just dash out the works on our own into the system it must go through the filtration first of the actual artists of the studio and i was making all the passes but for some reason basically the reason that they gave me is i like i lack soft and hard skills that are required to work with us and we don't see the future where we fit together you know I mean, you're also a recent graduate, like, yeah, like it's Very like, oh, you don't have soft skills. It's like, yeah, I graduated from university like a month ago. Like, it's kind of like yeah. you get what you pay for. <laughs> it's pretty standard that like, you know, when it comes to learning things like soft skills, you get trainees that are out straight out of school. That's like what's going to happen. Well. I think I was doing decent because I spoke to the, all the other trainees. We were like sitting on all that box and uh, apparently even like uh, the department of people who are making the portraits, you know, for like all the guys who operate the tank and whatnot and all the different tasks that include making more complicated like paintings. Uh, they actually wanted me in their department when they saw my portfolio. Oh. So, well, no now idea. they don't get it because now you're going to go take your portfolio somewhere else. That's and exactly gonna miss what out. I'm going to do. Yep. And uh, the reason why am I more happy now than uh, I was uh, yesterday? Yesterday it was, you know, like an aftershock. I didn't expect it. Nobody expected it. It, uh -huh. it came out of nowhere and uh, without good enough reason now that I know about it. 
because it's like, oh my god, I lost my security, I lost my money, I can't pay rent next month. I'm gonna be homeless. <laughs> but uh, I, now that I look at it, uh, definitely I'll have to work a little bit more, but I'm my own employed person. You know, I still have a couple of side gigs that I was doing while I was working at the studio because I wanted to, well, I wanted more money, you know. Uh -huh. But uh, now I get free time to practice things that I actually want to do, especially in this community. Because uh, basically how my work uh, looked in the studio is uh, we're working with the 3D assets in Unreal Engine or Blender, and then we're just doing post-production, and yeah. that's it. It's not much They give a you a, a 3D model of a tank, they give you a 3D model of a dragon, they ask you to have a dragon getting shot by a tank. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. That's how it was. And uh, I figured that uh, I don't think I would enjoy it that much if I were doing that for the next couple of years. It doesn't seem like the kind of place you're going to retire from. Definitely not. Definitely not. I doubt anybody would. Uh, well, nobody from the 2D department, definitely not. No, no, no. It's the 2D artists at like a game studio, they tend to be fairly... Um, you know, fungible, interchangeable. Like you don't feel like, you know, unless you're uh, Gen Z and you get, uh, not, oh, wait, her name is Gen Z, uh, not the generation, not the Zoomers, but uh, the uh, art director over at um, Supergiant Games who did the art for Hades. Oh. Uh, she, you know, her whole art style, like defining the entire brand of the studio or whatever, you get, you don't see a lot of those like anywhere ever. Um, and certainly not at a big corporate studio that's full of, uh, that's focused on, you know, tanks. 3D models of tanks. Yeah, it's not really a thing. So, uh, yeah, I think you're probably, I, I knew you're going to be fine. You're going to be fine. Uh, I think, I think as well. It's definitely more dynamic time in my life, but I'm glad it happened. Her name's Gen now, Z, right? Or am I getting it wrong? I'm getting it wrong. I guarantee I'm getting it wrong. Gen Z, yeah. Gen, like Jennifer? Yeah, yeah, like short for Jennifer. I don't know if it's short for Jennifer. Uh, it might be one of those, like, she has a, she might have a, a Asian name and then, like, an Americanized name. I'm not sure. Hmm. I don't know her personally. I've only seen her in passing. <laughs> not Generation Z. Yeah, J-E-N-Z-E-E. -E -E. She's incredible. Uh, I love her stuff, and I've always really liked Supergiant Games' games, uh, going all the way back to Bastion out on the freaking Xbox Live Arcade, you know? And, uh, yeah, it's been really cool to see that there's an illustrator out there who gets treated as, like, you know, the core branding element for an entire successful game studio. I think it's really cool. It, isn't that the dream? I mean, kind of, yeah. Like, we, isn't I think all of us would, like, that is... if. I feel like that's for me like the what would be like the dream if I was going to be working at a game studio is to be able to um, you know help define what the sort of look and the brand of the whole studio is. It feels like uh, sharing uh, your uh, imagination with the world, you know, uh, yeah. and the world praising you gives you a bunch of yeah. Bunch who doesn't love some advice. good attention and praise, right? Yeah, yeah, exactly. Anyways, uh, I'm going to be... Thanks for coming on and giving the update. I'm going to like uh, be keeping this stage mostly to myself for these kinds of streams, but you're always welcome to pop up and, and, and pop in when you got some stuff to talk about. Yeah, thank you for the feedback. Yeah, man. Uh, good luck. I have a feeling you're going to be doing all right. All right, getting past the beginner tutorial dungeon and realizing there are actual... Still, uh, actually, still thousands who are able to do hyper realism. So, you do need a cool style. Yeah, it's like that is the big thing. It's like um, I, I was just recording a, a video yesterday uh, about how, like, I didn't actually do tutorials and um, like studies when I was getting started, that I really just started with learning my developing my own style. And I actually think that that's like the way that people should do it. Because, you know, like, 
if you can develop just like basic technical skills, you think that's like a prerequisite for something else, but I mean, it can help bring out what your real voice is, but it's not like, it's not a mean, it's not a means to an end. It's like, I mean, it's not like a, it's not an ends into itself. That's what I mean to say. You don't get to like, say like, well, I, I'm really good at drawing from reference and therefore, uh, you know, I'm gonna be able to like define like the whole, you know, creative ideal for a company or I'm going, I, you should you should care about what my original characters are or like, you know, buy my art book. It's like it, technical stuff is really just like, can be helpful in expressing your creative voice. But I think the part that's most important and often that takes the longest to develop is the creative voice itself, which is counter to the advice that is being given in most corners of the internet. So take that for what you will. It's wild how many studios rely on their art style for marketing and recognition and often leave the artists with the least security. Hmm, Pales Arts, right. 100% correct. I feel like I'm stuck in realism, Lal, because uh, I want to develop my own style. I'm insecure to go look uh, into not looking as, t quote, technically good. I don't know, but you're not really doing realism. Like, your, your work is pretty stylized, Kim. Oh, uh, Del Mons is saying I love hyperrealism, but what's the career path for it? What is the career path for hyperrealism? Uh, there are definitely, like, I mean, some of it is, like, teaching. Some of it is, I think, uh, there are people who really want wall art that is, like, of a thing. There's, uh, you know, there's not only, like, custom portraiture. Like, pe some people actually just want to hire an artist to do realistic portraiture of them. Um, but there's also, like, people who want a, like, a picture of the thing that they like, whether it's a car or something related to their job or something having to do with their, like, you know, their identity, you know, through the through their work or through their hobbies, and they want, like, a really great-looking picture of that thing. Um, lots of people love pictures of animals, of their pets. is like, a major industry. Pet portraits is, like, big, big money. So being able to do, like, a really great picture of a corgi is something that is potentially very valuable if that's the path you want to go down. I mean, that's definitely not where I think a lot of the people in here are interested in sort of imaginative realism and therefore like the idea of doing pet portraits for a living for a really long time going forwards is like, I don't think that's what most of us are going for, but I don't think it's bad. That's not what I would do. Are you blind to your own style? Yes. <laughs> I think most people are blind to their own style. I know I was blind to my own style for a long time. I have slowly been trying to figure out what my style is um, because it's like important to me that I like know how to reproduce it, especially when it comes to education. I need to know what's different about what I do compared to other people. Matt Kusaris, welcome. I left a AAA firm. Uh, uh, I left AAA for a smaller studio, and I can uh, have more freedom and influence. I ended up being a creative director a few years later, and it was definitely more due to my specific style than I think. Um, yeah, I mean, like, I think that working in a smaller, more focused uh, game company probably is better for people who really want to have like a specific style and a specific voice to their work. I haven't really ever gotten to do that personally. Um, I almost ended up doing a couple of freelance gigs with some smaller studios with more, you know, having some, some more iconic styles, but it never ended up being my actual job. I always thought that might be something where I would end up someday. Is that like a smaller game studio like that. But yeah, I having like um, my my sort of skill stack led me to very quickly become an art lead when I ended up, we you know, when I was like 
uh, working in the games industry because like not only do I have like a bit of a style but I also which catches people's attention but also like um, I do a lot of teaching and a lot of mentoring and so like it ended up naturally kind of leading into a management role there is like for some people they just want to do the art and for other people they want to do kind of a mix of things and if you like doing a mix of things and you like working with people then there's like a lot of opportunities inside game studios that go beyond just your painting ability some of the people I know have moved into art direction outsourcing management things like that as well as like you know art leads and sort of hybrid art management roles there's a lot out there for people who are into different sort of stuff Hey, Dustin, feel free to shout out if anything interesting happens as far as subs or raids and stuff. I do not know why my um, why OBS no longer pings whenever one of the overlay things happen. Did I? Oh, wait. It might, it, is it because I turned this off? Let me try. We'll see what happens next time somebody raids or whatever. Thanks, man. Uh, yeah, I can be sure to keep an eye out. Cool. Thanks. Oh, yeah. And uh, Kim's contractually obligated to remind me about her brushes today. I installed them. I got them here. I've been trying out a lot of new brushes. I was poking away at some of Kim's blending brushes. You might act. Oh, uh, thank you, Smalley LC. Let's try for two times tier one sub. That's uh, that's an amazing test, and it didn't work. Nothing pinged on my end, so I have no idea what the, the matter with stream elements is. Wait, wait, wait. Is this it? That's the one. Okay, I finally found it. Thanks so much for the ten uh, donating ten bucks to like see if I could you could help me figure that one out. Now we're uh, we're at eighty nine total subscribers. That puts us just eleven subs away from the sub goal. I'm not sure what happens when we reach the sub goal. If you guys have any ideas of what we should be doing once we get to the sub goal, let me know. I got it, guys. I'm always going to find the buttons eventually. I'm a buttons guy. What's what some of the what was some of the sentiment about um, the re-enchantment you got studying art? How visual interest increased forever. Hmm, this is something I was talking about a little bit uh, in relation to mid-journey. Uh, the default smudge blend tool in CSP is pretty good, but I want more variety. Okay. Um, yeah, the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, I am, seriously, my brain is running at, like, super low capacity today. But, uh, yeah, so I was, yeah, I was talking about it yesterday a bit. It was like, you know, there has been this, growing thing that's been happening kind of in the AI world where people are like, hey, is everybody else is everybody else okay? Because I've been getting kind of bored with AI. And they were asking me like, hey, do, do you ever get bored of art? And I'm like, no, of course not. <laughs> um, the, the, there's just like, I don't know. I don't, I don't find anything that, let's see. Kim's got the 2020 brush set. Kim, I think your brushes, I, I think I'm going to have to tweak them to use them. We'll see. Um, I don't know about you guys, but like art doesn't get boring to me, especially because I always find like new avenues of exploring it. One of the things I thought was really interesting, I was comparing some notes with some friends who also had messed around with AI. And um, there was this kind of impression that we were all getting that like after having spent a couple of years messing around with AI, it was still AI was still kind of interesting, but what was really, but it was actually like really reinvigorating to like getting back to the fundamentals of art. Like for me, I am coming back to this sort of retesting of my artistic fundamentals in light of having spent a year like messing around with AI really heavily. Um, let's see. So I'm using Kim, Kim's brush here. I, I can't, I can't get the opacity up to 100%. What am I doing? 
Oh, I got the layer turned down to 30% somehow. Whoa. I don't know how I managed to change the layer opacity using a hotkey. No wonder everything was behaving weird. Whatever. I'll get this worked out. <laughs> I'll figure it out here. So yeah, I messed around with AI for like a year um, really heavily and tried to integrate it into my workflow because I thought like, wow, this is going to help me get all the results that I want faster. And it's going to be so good to be able to get to the point in the process where I'm you know, most interested in it, like without having to kind of wait around doing all of like the procedural nonsense that is sometimes happening with art. But um, instead of getting deeper and deeper into AI, what I found is I was actually kind of like bouncing off of it and back towards like the technical side of art uh, to a degree that I'd never really been true for my work before. Like I was never like a technical, I was never really into the technical side of art. I'm gonna try to exaggerate this a little bit here. Um, and so yeah, I was talking about this yesterday where it's like, I kind of, you know, like messing with AI kind of like got me back to the point now where I'm like really invested in doing the studies. And I've been having a blast doing the studies for the last couple of months. And I don't really see an end in sight. I think I'll probably at some point slow down on doing studies as aggressively as I have been recently. But I have been so invigorated to keep messing around with them because I've, um, because like I've been making so much progress and it's been like opening up these new doors for me. And I, I just like, I get excited to sit down and paint every single day. <laughs> yeah. Um, Dustin is saying that like, yeah, he's tried out Disco. I, I showed him Disco Diffusion like last year when I was first getting into it and he was messing around with it. And now he's doing art for the first time in 25 years. It's like, there's something about, I think this is something that people have sort of largely discounted about the potential of AI is that a lot of people that are gonna get into it are, uh, are just going to become more curious in art more generally. I think people see it as this like, um, exit from art when really I see it as this kind of entrance into it. All right. Um, what am I going to do? I am going to start, I'm going to do my brand new, apparently the day that I was showing off my soft brush technique, a lot of people watched that YouTube video a lot more than usual. And a lot of people commented on it to me later. Like I had friends reaching out. I had a People comment to me on Discord. They're like, oh, you're the guy who was talking about the soft brush. And I'm like, what? Like, I'm the soft brush guy? When did that happen? All right, I'm gonna make a little bit more of adjustment here. This is a super awkward angle. I'm gonna turn this down a little bit. Ugh. I need to tweak this. I need, to I need to tweak this for my own sanity here. Okay, I'm not the soft brush guy yet. Right now I'm the lassoing and trying to get the anatomy right on this character guy. Do, do, do. There's like this whole shoulder back thing here I think needs to get pushed out or something. Hmm? Like this. We need to like I need to like turn it so we're seeing more of the back a little bit. I'll figure this out. Yeah, have a safe time lawyering, Sam. doesn't want to learn art he thinks it's too hard art is hard but it's like i mean it's like the same thing people say about any kind of hard game as they're like oh i don't think i could play that it's too hard and you think man there's no one who's going to be playing this because everyone who talks about it talks about how it's too hard and then you know elden ring goes and sells a bazillion copies and redefines the way that people make games and stuff 
And you're going, okay, maybe there's something to this whole hard thing. Maybe so, Maybe people really like challenge. Maybe people want to be put in a position where they're having a difficult time messing with something. I think it's true. I think they do. I think we like bemoan challenge, but then when we're really confronted with it, when we really bring it into our lives, like we say, damn, I'm going to get good at this. I want to commit to this. It's like an opportunity for us to commit and like, challenge ourselves and expand as people. Hard things are important. They're good. This face, I know it like, it looks like William H. Macy wearing a dress right now. We'll get there. Don't worry. I think <laughs> there's a lot of things that are making it look like William H. Macy right now. I'm looking at it and I'm just like, oh boy. Got some stuff going on over here. I'm going to keep it simple in general for the time being. I might not even. This hairline is like not doing me any favors. There we go. A little better. Just need to shave a little here and there. Is art is art making the Elden Ring of skill building? Yeah. Sure, I like both those things, so I'm going to say they're the same. Yeah, I want to give your brushes a try once I get to the rendering, I think. And uh, if you can muster the courage to come on stage and tell me about what the fuck is going on with them, how to use them, because I find myself horribly confused by other people's brush sets. Like, that's been my primary experience with trying to test out brush sets I've been downloading, is that I don't, I'm not sure what they're for or how people use them. Or, like, and so I, like, make a couple of brush jokes and it, it gets very confusing. And why why is Dustin Prime subbing? What's going on? <laughs> oh wait, because you have a free you have a Prime sub. I don't see any reason why you shouldn't. Anybody who's got a Prime sub should sub. It's free. All right. Okay, let's try this again. So, hey Hexum, how's it going? I just used the medium hard round brushes and then and just do stuff. I don't even bother with different brushes. And hey, that's been my story for a long time. But I'm through the going through this whole like personal exploration, learning how to do new stuff phase. And so I'm trying to do all of it. Yeah, three three brushes based from famous artist Sergeant Van Gogh and Renoir. Interesting. That's a really good philosophy for it. I've been using the hard round for most of my painting for the last 20 years. But I I've been I was just watching a tutorial about the mixer brush this morning, you guys. Mixer brush seems crazy. I'm going to have to get through it. I use Hawthorne most of all if that helps. I mean that does help. But I'm on dinner duty. I've actually got uh, elbow deep in a massive paella. <laughs> that sounds awesome. <laughs> I don't want to take you away from your paella time. Um, so I won't, I won't bug you about coming on, but like, uh, maybe sometime if you do want to like basically use this as a free ad spot for your brushes, you are welcome to come on and do that. If that is tempting to get you to come on mic at all at some point. It's a beast batch cook. Oh, that sounds really good. Sounds really good. I haven't done paella before. Paella, I, I went out to Spain and everywhere had paella and half the time it was shit, um, but it looks kind of easy. It's I think the only way it looks difficult is if you cook a ton of it. Like they have those giant, like it looks like a truck tire full of paella inside the kitchens at some of these Spanish restaurants. I think I think they're just trying to make paella look like it's harder than it really is. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Let's let's get into what is really happening here. I've been sort of farting around with this thing today. All right, soft brush, are we ready for soft brush? 
So the basic idea, oh, if you make shakshuka, you could probably do a paella. Dude, I can make the fuck out of some shakshuka. I can definitely handle a paella. All right. So uh, let me talk to, uh, about the soft brush because people seem to really dig me talking about the soft brush. So in case you guys haven't been hip to what I've been going on, uh, going on about here, um, the basic idea is like, you know, in painting, painting's all about transitions, you know? That's like a thing you can say and sound kind of smart. But generally, like, if you look at like a lot of Magic the Gathering cards especially, they do this thing where they have this like tight little um, spotlight. They're like, okay, there's a spotlight in the center of the figure and then it like kind of, the light kind of fades off towards the top and bottom. And I was thinking about this, I was talking about it and I was like, why don't I just go ahead and soft brush in all of those larger, broader painterly transitions, like these larger light forms at the beginning using a soft brush, give it a try, see if it speeds things up. And immediately as I started doing that, I started producing way, way better studies. Like, I, I mean, my studies felt like they jumped up suddenly once I started doing this. And I don't think it was because this is necessarily like a revolutionary technique. I just think it was like a moment for me to like, A, really prepare the structure of what was going on underneath it before I started working in these really big broad strokes. But then also like it got a lot of what was busy work kind of in the middle of the painting established in like really, really short amount of time. Like the, the time it takes to like lay in a really quick soft brush, like kind of airbrushed loose. Um, you know, you can see it's just like a couple of brush strokes and like nothing's really where it needs to be. It's not precise. It's, it's like kind of purposefully imprecise, but you get this sort of loose dimensional look at, at the whole figure after like less than 10 brush strokes, which, uh, I mean, if efficiency is on your mind, that sounds like a pretty good deal. And then instead of like, you know, if you're working with a hard brush, even if you're working with one that's got nice blended edges like this, you end up like, you know, with a certain amount of chunkiness that you then later go in and try to like render back out and you have to kind of go in and clean up the tool marks. The tool marks that's left over from the soft brush is like really minimal. It leaves, the tool mark that it leaves is like these nice, soft, creamy transitions that get chopped up by the more precise hard edge strokes later. So you don't really have to worry about the kind of like weird leftover tool marks that the soft brush is leaving for you. It's actually leaving something that's really useful, even in the way that it's failing, it's kind of succeeding, which is cool. And so I have been really excited about it. It's um, it just feels like what used to take me two hours now takes me 90 minutes. And I feel like the overall quality of it is higher. And I'm being a little bit more considered in my overall approach to the entire painting process as a result of doing things this way. So uh, in the spirit of wanting to learn and share for myself and then like pass it along to other people, I've been really stoked to like tell people like, hey, check it out. I've been doing this thing with this soft brush. I used to avoid this tool. Now I've got a place for it in the toolkit. And, um, and I've been having a really good time. It's been great. So if you guys want to try it out yourselves, go ahead. I've got, uh, this is the current reference image over on the discord. There's a link to the discord. Uh, glad you're going to try it. Kim, I saw that you were kind of aghast when you discovered that this might be a thing. Cause like, I think a lot of people who have been doing traditional painting, uh, or not traditional painting. I'm, I'm so used to like talking about digital art as being like the traditional way of doing things in the world of AI. But like, you know, now that there's, um, you know, in, in sort of digital painting, most of the people I know that do kind of a classical style digital painting technique, they have avoided the oh, soft you, brush, have avoided the uh, airbrush. The could whole you stream time. to the stage? Oh, stream to the stage. Sure. Absolutely. Is Jay calling me out. Boop, boop, video and then VCAM. This should do it, right? Should be good. Yeah, you're good.
So Dustin, have you uh, have you been getting back to uh, making more studies? Have you been on the study train a little bit? I know you haven't been. I haven't seen anything posted from you. Yeah, I've been I've been on the study train. Yeah, I, I just have not been ready to post more. <laughs> are you are you worried you're going to look foolish because you're around people who like do this more professionally? No, for my own reasons. Okay, <laughs> you can have your own reasons. I just uh, you know. Pretty pretty welcoming environment here. The more people who are like at the beginning of their journey that are posting stuff, like the better I feel about this whole project. Cause like I want to invite people in who are like really close to the beginning, and I don't want them to walk in and see a bunch of people who are all like um, freaking who are all like incredible professional artists. Thank you, Matt Kosaurus. Tier one for six months in advance. Oh my God, six months. That's a hell of a sub. All right. So I've got a little, see, I've got this little bit of a weird gap here. As a result of this, man, you guys are big on the subs today. Appreciate it. Maybe uh, people are resubbing after the subs are sort of running, are running out. The, uh, let's see. Okay, so I'm back to the soft brush here. Level 900 round, uh, round, hard round skill. That's right. I can't speak. I, I don't know if I can paint today. I'm, I'm really like, I think I worked, I think I, <laughs> blaming it on, again, on, I went to the gym yesterday for the first time in like week because I I think I was coming down with something at the end of last week and so this week I'm feeling I was feeling powerful I was feeling good so I got into the gym and then today I'm just like I'm like ruined my arms are tired my brain's tired I bought Blasphemous too I started ducking in on Blasphemous too a little bit as like a, a sort of evening retreat but then I started playing it this morning a little bit. <laughs> I'm thinking about maybe playing it again after the stream. <laughs> um, Blasphemous is a is a beautiful creation that is seems like it's designed just for me. Somebody who loves both weird, you know, Christian religious uh, pop culture and, uh, and Metroidvanias. Yeah, I love um, I I love that stuff. But I also was a little frustrated by Blasphemous One. There was some stuff just in the in the game design. Hey, uh, Raider from Leo Val. Thank you so much, Leo Val. Welcome, welcome. But yeah, Blasphemous 1 frustrated me a little bit, so I'm excited to jump into Blasphemous 2. It seems like they've got a lot of learning lessons from the last game applied. Brand new Metroidvania to dig it on. This was one of those times where I was like playing it, and I was like, man, you know what? Maybe I should make a Metroidvania, which is a... Uh, Pretty absurd idea, considering I have absolutely no skill in this, like, you know, in this uh, this this uh, sphere of expertise. But uh, it sounds really fun, you know. I really like those things. All right, so I need to make sure that I'm not focused on the details. The whole point of the of the um, soft brush here is that it's giving me these like larger, broader kinds of um, transitions. I don't really need to get into the fine detail stuff, but I want something that feels like a sort of blurry, out of focus version of the painting completed first. And then especially with these sort of larger, broader like uh, gradients that are happening, like the one I'm putting in here, I wanna make sure I get these because these are the ones that are gonna really work for me later. And then it's also a tool where I can kind of exaggerate the lighting a little bit. Like I don't think that it, the reference isn't going this dark as it's getting out of the core highlight, but I like the idea of it like being a little bit more focused and dramatic on the lighting. Like there's this um, bright light kind of hitting the side of the face here on the model, but I wonder if maybe I darken this up a little bit and focus the light a little bit more like a magic card illustration if it's gonna end up looking better. 
I enjoyed Blasphemous 1. We'll also get to at some point. Gotta get rid of Baldur's Gate 3 and upcoming Cyberpunk DLC. See, that's that's the thing. It's like I never got into Baldur's Gate, and so I don't have that monkey on my back. I'm free. I already beat Baldur's Gate in my own mind. All right. So with that done, we can move on to the meat and potatoes of this thing. Uh, actually, you know what? Yeah, let's do, I think though, the way I've been doing it that's been working out is after I get past the sort of soft brush stage here, I've been going in with more, uh, slightly more precise cuts with my um, hard round. And um, building up, making sure the values are like where I want in kind of a rough way. And uh, that's going to preempt me adding color to it. So I still want to get to something that looks kind of like a rough value before I get to start doing things with gradient maps and such. Yeah, it's Cyberpunk DLC is coming out soon. And uh, I also never played Cyberpunk, so I don't have that monkey on my back either. There's something about like open world first person RPGs that like never got me. My little brother does coding and stuff and uh, but it makes zero sense to me. Yeah. <laughs> Armored Core though. I mean Armored Core is just that's classic video games. Armored Core is like a PS2 game. It's awesome. I was like wondering like, oh, what are they going to do to reinvent Armored Core for the modern generation? And they're like, yeah, nothing. We're just going to make a PS2 game with like PS5 graphics. Well, it's actually, <laughs> it's like, actually, no, it's, they're going to make a PS2 game with PS4 graphics released on the PS5, which is, I mean, it, it's like boomer game development at its finest. I love it. I love that they're doing that. Armored Core has been ruining your sleep. It ruined my wrist. I like I started to get really bad hand cramps, and I was worried that maybe I needed to take a break from painting, take a break from streaming, and that like I was gonna have to put a wrist brace on. All I did was stop play Armored Core and it got better on its own. Yeah, Armored Core isn't just a test of your mind. It's a test of your, of your body, your phys the physical endurance of your hands, how fast and how intensely you can smash all the triggers at the same time. Yeah, it's, it's an insane number of inputs. It's like you're constantly dashing with the face buttons, and then you have four different weapons equipped simultaneously, each of them mapped to their own trigger so they can be hit simultaneously. And then another T1 sun for a half moon owl. Thank you so much. I don't know what I'm des deserving of all these subs, but I appreciate them. Did you play Dragon's Dogma? Excited for Dragon's Dogma 2? No, I never played Dragon's Dogma 1. I know... I've met people who tell me that all they think about is what it would be like for somebody to make another game like Dragon's Dogma. And it's made me wonder. Because like it, it, like from like an IP perspective, it looks so painfully generic. And so I was like, I don't know, this looks kind of weird. I mean, it's funny when the, uh, when the McElroy, McElroy brothers play it, but like, I don't know if that's necessarily enough for me to buy a game. You know, I like the idea of being able to climb on anything. Dragon's Dogma on Switch for five bucks. Five beans. That's like a Twitch sub. Yeah, that's a pretty darn good deal for a game that I know is like quietly like the cult, like a cult, super cult hit. People really, really love it. 
I don't think I would even need to like play it to recommend that people go buy Dragon's Dogma for five bucks. Dragon Dog Mud D's Nuts. Man, it's a good thing we got good jokes in the chat. It's a good thing we got the chat to keep these really good jokes running. <laughs> He's fucking killing it. <laughs> I love it. Oh, I, you know what? I was going to put on a playlist. Uh, Dustin, what was it? What was the playlist with the uh, royalty-free music? I was just thinking, like, uh, I mean, you put on some background noise now that we're no longer having the chat constantly in here. Studying electrical engineering, I used to uh, want to become a comic book artist. I don't draw enough now. Thanks for giving me exposure and experience to your stream, especially the Angelarium. Hey, hey, it's my, uh, uh, oh, senpai.tv stream beats. Um, yeah, copyright free music. Here we go. Let me know if that's too loud. I'll turn it down. It sounds like it's coming from your speaker. Anyway, I gotta put some headphones on. I think. Okay. And then I'm gonna bring it down in my mixer a little bit. See what my knobs think about this. The knobs don't wanna work for it. Let's try, I'm gonna bring it in on Spotify instead. Spotify web player, what the fuck? Don't give me a Spotify web, web player. <laughs> Dang, uh, just play it on here. Work my way through it. There we go. Better, good. Okay. Yeah, sounds good. The newly bought courgettes are rotten. That's the most disappointing thing ever. Produce ain't cheap. When you buy it and it goes bad, and you know it wasn't your fault, you didn't pack it away in the fridge forever. It's just like, you just got it. want to find somebody to blame I think that it's like you just want to <laughs> such a ball ache <laughs> is that a is that a Britishism yeah we eat a lot of produce in my house the whole family likes to keep it healthy I feel like I've got a few years to sort of, you know, create good habits, create good taste in my kids, because someday they're going to move out and uh, they're going to be able to drink as much Mountain Dew and Pepsi as they want. And I need to set habits like today. Otherwise, they're going to uh, kill themselves with soft drinks. They thirst for them. 
Oh yeah, raspberries. Raspberries will go dead in a heartbeat. Raspberries are hanging on by a thread as soon as you get them. They must be hard as shit to transport. Raspberries are easily the most depressed of all fruits. You give them the slightest excuse and they're like, all right, guys, I'm out of here. You got to pump them up. You get those raspberries in the house. You got to go, hey, raspberries, it's great to see you. I haven't had you in a while. It's awesome to have you back. And the raspberries are like, yeah, it's okay. <laughs> Yeah, 50% chance they have mold. I would say that's about right. That's bad. Those are bad odds. Strawberries at least have the decency to hold up for a couple of days. Those raspberries, man. They're pricey and they're like, they're ready to off themselves at any given second. They're, they are very, very temperamental. But they're good though. And they're kind of like good for you too. They're like not overly full of sugar or whatever. Like when I was really watching what I was eating, I would like dessert would just be a shitload of raspberries. I'd be like, you know what? This is how, this is how the wealthy live. This is what being a, this is a premium lifestyle. I feel like this painting's gonna fall apart. <laughs> I'm like, I'm so unconfident. I like have, I'm like stoked for this new process. Like this feeling that I have like a, a clean process that I can kind of rely on that's been producing nothing but strong results recently. But like today, my brain is like, I could feel it. I could just feel it running slow. And so I'm like, okay, well, it's not gonna be as good as my best one this previous week. But how bad is it going to be <laughs> is sort of what my mind is telling me. How bad is this actually going to turn out? Raspberries are bougie as hell. It's like wearing white clothes. You could Wearing white clothes is bougie because you know that they're going to get dirty. You're like, yeah, I'm just going to wear this until it's stained once and I'm going to throw it out because there's no, there's no saving it after a certain point. The raspberries, you're like, I'm buying these on the chance that they're good. Get a couple of handfuls in. That's all you ever get out of them. You can't buy more raspberries because you're never going to get to them before they all just turn into a pile of moldy mush. Oh, my freaking the freaking music! It played one track and then <laughs> and then it immediately like bailed on me. What's going on over here? That was. Is there a playlist button? Oh, there's two songs. <sighs> okay, wait, 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 wait. Stream, um, let me look up stream beats on my Spotify here. And then pray. Okay, stream beat by Harris and just hope that this isn't gonna be. Just listen to this one. I just pray it's not somebody who's done a stream beat style playlist that they're gonna then, you know, sort of patent troll everybody on. But jazz is into Dragon's Dogma. Everybody loves Dragon's Dogma. I've never heard anybody say I played Dragon's Dragon's Dogma and I thought it was a total piece of shit and I wish I had my money back. I thought I'm gonna play it. The thing I'm looking, thinking about getting back into is more Vampire Survivors. That multiplayer is pretty good, playing it with kids and stuff. It's such a chill game. You just hang out and like, you know, it's just a countdown until you lose anyway. Like, if you actually even beat a level, all that happens is like, you just, it just like kicks you out after 30 minutes. It always kills you. Yeah, Vampire Survivors is couch multiplayer right now and it's really good. 
It's like harder playing multiplayer than it is playing solo, but it kind of doesn't matter because the game is so low stakes. It's just like fun to chill and play with people. Like anybody can play it. You can sit down with somebody who doesn't play games and you can get on multiplayer Vampire Survivors and have a decent time. Perfect game to kill 30 minutes, exactly. And it's not, it's got a timer and everything. It's like in 30 minutes, you can go back to what you were doing. For the next 30 minutes, it's you and vampire survivors and maybe a girlfriend <laughs> or a kid or whoever you got. You know, you've got relatives over for the holidays and you're like, we don't really want to talk. You'd be like, you know what? I've got this thing. It's on Game Pass. It's called Vampire Survivors. It's just one stick. Put it in your weird super right-wing uncle's hand and have them talk about something besides Fox News for 10 seconds. It's going to be awesome. Vampire Survivors brings people together across the whole political Kim spectrum. Kim was kind enough to point out the music's a little bit loud. Oh, is it loud, loud now? Let me get the desktop audio pulled down here. Actually, if I do this. Okay. My knobs here. Got the wheels of steel. I got some metal metal knobs and I mapped them to different key programs. So Discord and uh, Spotify have their own colored knobs in my setup. Thank you, Kim. I always appreciate somebody pointing out when I'm fucking something up. What do I want out of this that I don't currently have out of it? Mm, I'm... It's loose. It's kind of crap. Doesn't need to be much yet. Let me just get a couple more marks in here. Define some of these folds real quick. Some of the big ones. And then I'm gonna go and add a little bit of a glaze to this this one. I was thinking about it. I think that um, you know I've got this process right now that is oof, it is miles ahead of my process when I first started, and that's been part due to like little experiments. Now that I've got a process that's working pretty well, I, I like I haven't experimented so much in the last couple of days. So my plan right now is I'm going to do a couple more of these where I kind of like feel like I'm dialed in and I know what I, I'm doing. And then I'm going to start playing around again because I think that there's more out there. I think there's a lot more out there for me to learn. I think that if I got good with more tools and I got better with like um, kind of smashing steps together into a more efficient kind of cluster of like uh, of steps I think I could get the time on a painting like the the studies I've been doing on stream they've been taking me about two hours I think I can get what used to be a two hour study down to 20 minutes if I really really knew what I was doing if I was really diligent about my tools and the order I did everything and like the point isn't like oh wow if I could do them in 20 minutes just imagine how insanely uh, how much money I would make from being able to like do even more studies like the point of getting the time down on doing these things faster is because they represent a set of like basic skills that you could use in other stuff and so it just means like less fighting with the the tools you know less kind of weak fiddling around back and forth and more into like focusing on creativity yeah I've learned it all it's only downhill from here might as well hang up the old paintbrush exactly
he slams them out in 30 minutes. Well, part of the reason why Bob Ross was able to slam out his paintings in 30 minutes was because when you saw him paint, that was like the third time he had done the painting. He would prepare really, uh, he would prepare really thoroughly before he went on air. And so he would have already like worked up a version of the piece to try to figure out what he was gonna do and how he was gonna do it before he started like demoing it. And so while the painting he was doing was like a way to finish a painting, it's hard to like put your thoughts down, you know, in a way that's as efficient as somebody like Bob Ross was, was doing. So he cut out all of the kind of fiddling and mistakes and everything and focused entirely on like drawing this really, really straight line from beginning to end. Which is sort of what I'm getting out of being able to do these studies also because, you know, I don't have to fiddle around with figuring out what is the image going to be. You know, I just need to worry about my, uh, how I'm going to be putting it together. And I think that, like, the speed of it is not really so much the point because I really like the time I spend doing it. But there is something about, like, the sort of being able to, like, do it in a hyper-efficient way that speaks to, like, the, um, yeah, the underlying skills. I want to have the underlying skills and like the time is a measurable way of addressing that problem. You know, you need to, people like to have um, problems they can measure. And so if we're going to say, well, how good are you at art? You'd be like, I can do a study like this in 20 minutes. No ref. And it's not really meaningful, but it is measurable. So, you know, it's comfy. So, <clears throat> next step. I think I'm I'm pretty happy with where it is here. A little more reflective light on the sleeves. Right. Not that much. Oh, okay. I'm gonna cut in the background. I like doing this thing where I cut in the background. I've been doing like all gold backgrounds recently, so I'm gonna do a teal background. I saw one in my folder yesterday. I was like, damn, I should do teal backgrounds again. Dude, speaking of game controllers, I have been seeing people do those like little mini flat hitbox controllers where they have the stickless arcade pad where it's just like 20 buttons all fanned out on an array. And I just think that's the coolest looking thing. I don't think I could ever learn how to play fighting games on something like that. I'm a controller kid myself. But uh there's something about having just this like absurd number of buttons all splayed out and to kind of rhythmically like smack through them in this like very controlled way, the way that fighting game players do. I think it's a really cool performance. And I think as a piece of hardware, that like massive layout of big round buttons looks really cool as like a you know, as a sort of piece of industrial design. I think those I think those controllers look sweet. I like I'm I'm like tempted to want to own one just to like have this like super flat all buttons controller just to like bust it out in front of people and be like check this thing out this is so cool. <laughs> but I don't I don't think I'd ever be able to use it. <laughs> want a Street Fighter tournament with a guitar hero controller? I could see it. People are really good at fighting games. I don't think it's, and the controller's going to hold them back. So they're so calculated in the way they play. Since using a joystick, I can't handle little game controller sticks anymore. Man, I don't know. I, I've always liked the controller all the way going back. Like, my fighting game I was probably best at was Soul Calibur 1. Well, I also I also fucked some people up in Soul Calibur 2 and 3. 
But there's something that feels really intuitive to me about the whole motion of it. So. I always liked the, uh, the game head sticks. Though I, I, the point where I abandon the sticks is for platformers, when I'm playing something like Super Meat Boy or Celeste, where I need to be able to like, um, wiggle back and forth a lot, like doing mid-air maneuvers. I want to be able to like, uh, I want to be able to use a D-pad. D-pad is like the only true option for platformers, I think. Though, uh, I guess the keyboard could be another one. My, my brother was a uh, pretty experienced in Dust Force. He was like semi-pro Dust Force player. And I saw him playing using a keyboard and I was like, yeah, that seems smart. That seems like the path. I'm still pretty good at Soul Calibur, I think. I think I can get back into it. It was like, it wasn't about knowing all the combos and stuff for me. It was like understanding the flow of the game. Having a sense of what your opponent was going to do and what your options were. And so it, it was like one of the only fighting games that got me to the point where I was actually playing mind games. And I felt like I was playing my opponent instead of playing the game. I used to do this thing at parties where I'd face backwards and beat people with Soul Calibur facing the other way. Because I would like, I knew what newbies were, newbies were always going to try to do. Um, in different situations, like during wake-up and stuff, and I knew what all the counters were, and so I just based off of listening to whether or not I was getting hit or if I was hitting them, I had kind of a, you know, flow of like what I could do to to get at them. And so I was able to like beat most beginners pretty, almost universally, like with multiple characters with my back turned to the screen. And then Dustin and I, we would hang out with friends sometimes. We'd play some Soul Calibur 3, and it was like infuriating. I was able to really deal out some punishment that I think eventually became unfun. Hey, Steve. Good to see you, man. Yeah, uh, raids are great. It's been, it's been nice to like come check out your stream and be able to meet you. Thanks for stopping in on mine. Yeah, uh, yeah. Dustin's saying that I was the reason why they had to figure out something to do besides Soul Calibur, which is a bit of a point of pride for me. I think when you make all of your friends have to change what game you're playing, you've beaten it. Achillic main? No way, man. Mitsurugi. Systematically dismantling my opponents. Good enough to beat all your friends, not good enough to beat any hardcore gamers. Yeah. I mean, that's where I got with both um, Soul Calibur and also some versions of Smash Brothers also. There's kind of a ceiling where you know that you need to start going to locals if you want to actually have a challenge. And I've never, ever wanted to do that. I just want to have a crew, and I also want to beat them. <laughs> I want to be able to get good enough where they like they dread playing against me but I don't ever want to like try to take it to the next level I don't want to do ranked I don't want to like go out to locals I just want to I want to have people over I want them to get good at the game I want them to think they're really good at it and then I want to beat their fucking ass <laughs> oh man Astaroth competitive for Soul Calibur 4 and 5 that's impressive
Okay. So we've got uh, we got a pretty good rough going here. And uh, it's all still black and white. I'm going to throw a little bit of a gradient on this, gradient map. Get a little bit of uh, basic uh, color interplay going. I think I'll probably end up masking it out in places to preserve like the pure black and white. Um, that's been cool. But um, I don't know, maybe it's like the the teal background with the white dress is ultimately going to be interesting enough color-wise. Ooh, look at this. I'm noticing these warm colors that are reflecting in, in the shadows here, and I'm looking for something that maybe does that. This isn't doing that as much. It's bringing these worms in, in these middle areas that I kind of want to keep relatively desaturated, and that's bringing blues in in these core shadows. So even though I really like that one, I think I'm going to ditch that. This is the inverted version of this, where it's a uh, inverted uh, color uh, temperature. And then this one is the one that I made that's like inverted, but it also takes the high end and like makes the cools go all the way to, to the highlights, which looks really good across here, because it doesn't create a break. It like smoothly transitions all the way up into there. That might be it. That might be the one. This does some cool stuff. And then I think once I get the skin tone on top of it, it's going to look really good. No Soul Calibur against this man. Yeah, I mean, if you're saying you play competitive, I mean, I guarantee you can whoop my ass in Soul Calibur 4 and 5. But if we ever meet in person and we have an opportunity to play some of the older Soul Calibers, ones where it's been a while since I got to play, and uh, and you've maybe not dug into them so deep, I will play you. And it. And it sounds pretty fun, actually. Also a huge thing for classical painting like Gustav Klimt, using models for reference and then decorating them in the way that you want. That's a really good idea. That's a really good idea. Taking one of these studies and just going to, getting it to a point where I feel like I am, uh, I've got what I want out of it in terms of it representing like the photo and then just taking it in my own unique direction. It's definitely something I should give a shot at on, sc on stream. Well, thanks Half Moon Owl for joining us today, and thanks for the subs. Let's see. Skin tone on this is looking a little weird, though. I might go a little bit more orange than what I had. And I might have to go in a little bit. Oh, it's on soft light. No wonder it's coming into it. It's so weird. It's like, this is not doing what I'm expecting. I was wondering why it was causing such a problem. Establishing some of the lore on Malekith. That's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, intentionally trying to double KO, like kill your opponent while getting you both to ring out simultaneously over and over and over again is a, definitely a flex. I'm gonna do a little thing on my hotkeys here. This has gotten me a couple of times. Keyboard shortcuts. Tools. I'm looking for the eraser tools. 
I only really, I don't know what background eraser tool is. I don't know what magic eraser tool is. I don't want them. I just want the regular eraser. So when I hit E over and over again, I only end up with eraser. That's what I want. Animators are super into fighting games. I could see it. I could see that some like the same people that are in the uh, in their like three D timelines plotting out all the individual animation frames are also like obsessed with frame data. Interesting. Yeah, when I was working at uh, Kabam, one of the guys in there from QA was a um, semi-pro Tekken player. But he was like, he got into like the top eight in some like national Tekken tournament that was being broadcast on like ESPN5 or whatever. All of the fundamentals of great animating in, in fighting games. Maybe. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> That's like, if you think about it, painting is a lot of like, like playing Super Smash Brothers. Okay, so I think what I'm going to do here is gradient map. On the lower end, I've got this blue, right? You can sort of see it. If I, if I switch it over to purple, you can start to see it emerging here. This, all this color range. Ooh, look at that. Yeah, if I wanted to go really surreal with the colors, that actually might do something. But it was in this blue range over here. And I'm thinking about having it be reflecting of the background color a little bit more. Before and after. Whoop. Maybe the color contrast actually is a good thing. If we push it the other way into that purple. Just sort of visually sweeping over this thing, giving it an ocular pat down before I go ahead and start going into the final layer here, final couple layers. Crisp animations, good transitions, high fidelity, visual clarity. Well, okay, yeah, that's all true. I remember when I was in college, the guy who was like the, the most experienced animator at the school walked in and what and and saw some of the uh, students playing Street Fighter Three, and he's like, "I don't get it. Like, the animation, the animation in this has no ease in and no ease out." I was like, "Yeah, because they're like you, you can't have like a like a lot of startup animation in a fighting game." He's like, "Oh, well, it looks it's they're not even really animated," was what he said. Is what I remember. I'm thinking, "What an asshole." <laughs> <laughs> Looking at a game as beautiful as Street Fighter 3 and going like, oh, they're not even really animated. A man should be brought to trial for a crime like that. You have to spend time in jail. Criticize Street Fighter 3 so unfairly.
This is looking flat to me. I'm trying to figure out what it needs. Maybe part of it is that like it's not actually conforming that well to the real wrinkles. That's not helping. There's a lot of these really soft transitions in here, and so I'm I'm not sure if I should be finding a tool that makes these transition these soft transitions faster and easier or if I should just get in there and poke at them and like make it uh, bring down the opacity a lot and just do a lot of little strokes. The temperature variation here is generally pretty uh, works pretty well, but I'm wondering if it's too much. Oh, that's starting to look better almost immediately, letting the blue take over. And then letting the orange just invade at the edges. Bad at fabric because everyone's got painted on clothes. Hmm. Yeah, fabric is fabric's its own special thing. Aside from you know any other subject you're going to paint, fabric has its own kind of character. Each different like fabric thickness and texture can have a very very different personality. So it's not just learning one thing. It's like learning a whole suite of things in order to get it to look good. kind of like funky space jazz thing with this woman in a cocktail dress has a very nice um, matching vibe to it got some city pop vibes going on here big time I'm gonna keep the dark colors at the top faded out like this, like the hair. I wanna keep it this faded blue. See if I can get it to stylize a little bit because it's really not the, I feel like the face up here is really not where the focus is. And so I wanna see if I can keep this kind of like focused on like less about value contrast and more on temperature, like color contrast. Kind of wash out the shadows. I think that might look cool.
So we opened up the uh, mentorships on huckleberry.art. I opened up a few slots in my mentorship class uh, a couple days ago. And we didn't really tell anybody about it, but we've been kind of opening up the information to more and more people. And uh, it sold out, which is very good. So I'm getting prepped to make sure everyone has all the info and that I have a plan on what I'm doing with this. And uh, we're letting people know that it's all sold out so we can start collecting some names for the waiting list. So if there's anyone who drops out next month and you want to throw your hat in, go ahead and sign up for the uh, waiting list. It's over on uh, huckleberry.art. There's a tab in, in the navigation for uh, mentorships. Right now, it's just me who's doing them. We're going to be opening up some more with some more teachers at some point soon. And uh, right now, I've just got the one time slot. I can exp I can double the size of my class by opening up a new time slot. So if we decide to do that, you know, and you're on the waiting list, then you'll be one of the first people to know about it. The Morbacher Atelier. Yeah, each uh, each mentorship purchase is for like one month. It's gonna be, the next time we sell it, it's gonna be a subscription item. So like, you'll just stay subscribed until you don't wanna do it anymore, or I kick you out. I haven't had to kick anybody out of a mentorship yet, but I'm looking forward to it. Oh, okay, cool. Girl boss mode, nice. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm gonna be, instead of, um, I'm gonna have one, I, I think the next time slot I'm gonna open up is Thursday evenings. So it's gonna be like um, 10 hours later in the day on Thursdays. So if uh, that way you, you shouldn't have to take time off work to join if you want to be in the evening session. But yeah, I didn't, I was only opening it up for a few slots at first to get things started. And uh, I anticipated they would sell out pretty quick. I've been getting mentorship applications for years and I haven't even been doing them. Like I just have people who've had heard that I had done mentorships and they would they would email me and ask to see if I would accept them. And so I finally emailed back those people and let them know that I had the uh, the thing open for the first time in several years and, and they sold out immediately once I did that. Yeah, uh, so I'm gonna be I'm gonna be opening up more mentorship slots. I'm gonna be finding some more people who can teach for Huckleberry, and then I'm gonna be working on the sort of on-demand education stuff, building a uh, you know videos for a curriculum. That's the other thing I've got going on with Huckleberry. I am looking forward to kind of putting a pause on every other bit of work I have just to focus on Huckleberry full time. It's like the most exciting thing I have in my life right now. I am so stoked to be uh, building this thing.
You could even say I'm chuffed. I'm chuffed and stoked. Yeah. I don't know, like, uh, for a while I had, like, applications. Because, so, like, I had more applications than I had mentees. Or, like, space to do mentees. And so I'd have people apply and I would, like, pre-kick people out by being like, Nah, I don't think you're a good fit for this. When's the retreat happening? <laughs> uh, no retreat planned yet. Uh, not really not really thinking about it seriously. But, um, yeah, this time out, I'm just, like, accepting people based off of, like, first come, first serve. It's a... If for no other reason, then it's just, like, new for me to do things that way. I want to see what it turns out if I don't put an onerous application process in the way of people signing up. Oh, Kim was asking what you do, you would do in the mentorship. Uh, so in the past, I mean, it, it's really going to be a little different based off of who's in it. Because some of the people who are applying are like um, professional artists. And some people who are applying are amateurs. Uh, who are in like, I anticipate we'll probably have people who are like full on beginners. Um, but yeah, like what I do is I try to figure out what people want, like what, where are they stuck in their art career or like their art progression. And my plan as a mentor is to help them achieve whatever their artistic goals are. So some of that is figuring out what those goals are. Other parts are doing weekly homework in order to um, complete projects with the pursuit of like, you know, achieving those goals. A lot of the people who've come to me have been like, hey, I want to work for this or that company. And I go like, yeah, you probably don't. And then I work with them on developing their voice and building their portfolio. Uh, some examples from around the community. I work with uh, Jake Frames Posh, who a lot of people around here know. Uh, Jake and I worked together, I think it was last year. He was my, I think my last mentee that I did through my old system. And uh, he had a really good experience, I think. You can talk to him about it if you have any questions about what his experience was like. And uh, I helped get him on his feet. Um, well, I mean, he was taking, I think, mentorships with other artists as well, different points. But I helped him establish his style and uh, really expand his portfolio and um, help him clarify what his artistic goals were. And, um, you know, he's still working at Arby's. It's not like I did. Um, I didn't cast a magic spell on it. But um, if you want to go take a look at sort of the before and after, go check out his sketchbook thread over on the sketchbook section on the Discord, and you can get a good sense of what a student who's worked with me has like before and after. Um, another person I worked with was uh, Adam Morrill, City and Grove. I worked with him um, in a similar capacity when he was like a guest on my web show. Like we were doing it sort of live for an audience, doing the mentorship. And uh, yeah, uh, I helped him get his, um, do his first Kickstarter and uh, helped him get started with his convention business, which is now his full-time income. So I helped him get things started on the business side. Art-wise, he's somebody who's got a really developed voice already. And, uh, you know, he's got a lot of his own skills that, you know, he doesn't really need my help with that. But there was a lot of, there's always a lot of, like, clarifying, like, hey, what do you want to do? And I can, as an outsider, I can give much more, more clear perspective on that than, um, you know, when you're sort of guessing at it on your own. And then when it comes to somebody who's still learning, I have the ability to give a lot of feedback in terms of, like, uh, helping them build the process and, like, uh, create a... Uh, technique for working speaking of technique man I sure am worse at this when I'm on stream 
Maddie was asking what art level would be a reason not to accept uh, mentorship. It, it was like every once in a while I run into somebody who I felt like was just um, not, you know, not realistic about knowing where they were artistically. And that was like what I was trying to avoid with the applications. There's no application process this time, but um, the point where it might be the biggest potential problem is like if you believe like you just need to do uh, one or two things and you're like, I, I actually had, I, I was on a, I was doing a presentation and someone came on the call and said, hey, um, I just need some, the person was asking, hey, do you, do you, uh, do you teach a business of art? I said, absolutely, I do. I, I'm, I kind of specialize in it. He said, okay, great, because all I need to learn is how to market my stuff. Because I've got everything else figured out. <laughs> it was like, they were in college still, and they were like, yeah, yeah, I actually know everything about art, and I'm already like uh, a full-time content creator. It's just that I'm not making any money, and it's because I don't know how to like get people to click on hashtags or whatever. And it's like, if you don't know kind of, if you don't have like a sense of humbleness about where you are and what you can still learn, it can sometimes be really hard uh, to like, um, to help people. Like I want people to get a lot out of the time they spend working with me. And so I want to work with people who are open-minded about learning and about, you know, getting outside feedback on their work and not somebody who's like, you know, convinced that they know everything or that, you know, maybe they, they are hoping that they, I will, as a matter of the mentorship, recognize that they're a genius and accelerate them into some sort of like secret club or whatever. You know, everybody I know who's built an art career is a matter of um, me working with them. It's just because, you know, they're, they're hardworking and dedicated to their craft and they have their own voice and they have their own goals. And like, you know, they, they get to know a lot of other artists that I know because they, um, they all share something in common in terms of like their interests. But um, skill level wise, I, I don't think it would be an issue. I mean, I'm, I'm looking forward to giving people lots of homework. I think somebody who is like less experienced is probably gonna get a decent amount out of working with me because I'm gonna give a lot of opportunities for them to like make images and then, you know, have conversations about how their the work process is coming together and you know, what they need to work on, what they need to study more. I've actually got the the part the students that worry me that I currently have are the ones that are like the working professionals. I need to figure out what they want. <laughs> you know, it's like there's only so much I actually can add to a working professional's repertoire as far as learning pain is concerned. I'm discovering a lot of technical stuff myself just recently, you know, through doing studies and stuff. So it's like, I don't think of myself as a master painter. I'm just somebody who's figured out a lot of the process and soft skills around all of this. You know, I've helped a lot of people build their careers, I've helped a lot of people find their voice. But I'm not, um, when somebody gets to a certain level of painting ability, I'm, I'm not necessarily going to be able to give them super unique feedback. Not something they couldn't get from their other peers, especially if they're like working professionally and they're surrounded by professional artists every day. I'm not gonna like come down from on top of Mount Olympus and give them secret information. I don't really have any secret information. Since watching Dave Raposa years ago, I actually love being judged. Yeah, I, I actually struggle with it sometimes still. I'm like not great about getting feedback. Um, it's not that I don't want to get better, it's that I I want to figure it out on my own. I don't want to feel like somebody's like, you know, telling me the answer to the puzzle. being really picky about all these folds and it's slowing this down in a big way 
So I was saying I was able to get this process down to about 90 minutes. And I'm still a little ways off to finishing this. I haven't even touched the hands yet. And I'm almost at an hour 50. You know, Jay, I think that like, you're going to, um, you have the ability to get a lot better at art really quickly if you let go of this idea of like you trying to figure out what something's supposed to look like and just make a lot of stuff in 2D. You know, a lot of what I've helped people with over the years is like letting go of things letting go of ideas on how they think they want to work or who they want to work for or what kind of artist they are or what they think the challenge is that they're up against and and sort of like introduce them to what they're really struggling with and focusing on what the challenge is that they're they're up against But yeah, I have a feeling that like once these mentorships start going, um, I know a lot of the one the other people that do them regularly, a big driver of interest in them comes from past students. And I've had 10 years of doing mentorships really successfully, um, but like, you know, not really as like in an organized way where I have like a place where people can go to a shopping cart and like put in their credit card information. So I'm kind of hoping that with the group mentorships, you know, having more people come through it pretty regularly and having some really good experiences with students that uh, I won't actually need to market this this much because I have a feeling that the students are probably going to talk to people in their community and tell them about the experiences they're having. And that's going to drive a lot of the interest. So I've, I've been talking about it this last week, but I don't actually anticipate I'm going to have to do it that much going forwards. You already know the main culprit of why your art suffers because you're lazy. Mmm. See, my mentor brain immediately wants to pick that apart. A lot of people do a lot of self-blaming. They're like, oh, the reason I'm bad is because I'm so bad or I'm so lazy, I'm so this or that. It's really hard sometimes to figure out where those feelings are coming from, what's driving them. And like getting to know that a little bit can really help. Kim say my problem is my crippling self-doubt yeah I don't know maybe With people who already have like a really strong voice and have already like made a little bit of a name for themselves, you know, I find that the thing that's often holding them back is just comes down to like business administration in a lot of cases. Like, hey, you need to commit to larger, scary projects that like are gonna take up a ton of your time, but are gonna be really worth it in the end. You're gonna be glad you did them. And so yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe it is crippling self-doubt that stands in your way. You know, and if you don't have a lot, if you haven't clocked a lot of hours like building business plans where you're like, 
hey, here's what my next Kickstarter is going to be. Here's what the scope of the project is. Like, here's how much time I'm going to spend building it up before I, I, I launch it. Here's how we're going to do the fulfillment on the back end. Like, if you don't go through all that a lot, then like, there's a lot of second guessing that can really stand in the way of just like pulling it off. Some of that I think comes from people's self-doubt, but other parts of it is just like, you know, you um, there's one thing or another, some other situation in your life that's prevented you from actually going through with these kinds of uh, business plans before. And uh, now that you don't, you're in a situation where you know you need to do more, but you don't really have any prior experience, you feel like, you know, you've got a lot of open questions and you don't really know, how, you don't really want to overcommit on something that's a bad idea. You know, you're cautious for a good reason. I've known people that like overcommitted to terrible ideas and ended up ruining themselves financially. So like the idea of like, hey, I'm not sure where to put my chips and I don't want to make a huge bet that's going to screw me over. I think it's a fair feeling. It's just like, you know, this is one of the things I actually really like doing with people is like helping them plan like what their next moves are going to be because as somebody who's done it a few more times, I can actually give like a little bit more of a precisely measured input on what's going to work. What the strategy is going to be and what the key dates are and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot about doing business, whether you're an artist or not, that just makes you feel dumb. Like there's just a lot of things like, I was talking to an artist the other day and they were saying how they had tried to build a course, but they hired a guy to build a website and the guy just like got it halfway done, did a shit job and then walked away with the money and never finished the project. And it's like, what, what do you do after that? Like, you must feel so stupid to have, like, given the money to somebody who just ripped you off and walked away, and you're no closer to finishing any of your business plans. And, uh, you know, you don't even have the password to this ugly website with your name on it. Like, what do you do? What, how, how would you, like, how do you move on from a failure like that? It's like, you know, that's that kind of stuff would get under anybody's skin. And so just being able to have like some people in your network that can answer those kinds of specific questions ends up being a big deal. So I, I often try to answer those questions for artists for free just because I don't have like a real business of, um, you know, selling like, oh, how to structure a Kickstarter, blah, blah, blah. Like I've given, I've just decided that in, rather than be the guy that sells business advice all the time, I'd just be... I'll just give that out for free for people who are like sort of in the same game as me, you know, because I would I know that I've, there have been plenty of times where I wish I could just ask somebody for the cheat codes to like help me figure out what the fuck I was doing what the what I was getting myself into. And so, you know, recently, as I've been trying to set up this school, I've been trying to cash in some of those favors, asking people like for help to try to figure out what I'm doing. But yeah, for the most part, I just offer that kind of stuff for free because it it's really a bummer to be um, just having a business make you feel like an idiot. <laughs> yeah, like there's like some stuff where it's like, you know, you're like, how do you do this thing? And somebody just gives you a link to a website and they're like, here's a service that does this. You go, oh my God, I wish I had known that years ago. I could have done so much. The reason why I was able to finish my book was because I had a friend introduce me to a certain type of editor, a certain type of like writing education service that helped people develop exactly the sort of thing that I was stuck on. And without that insight, I don't know if I would have ever been able to fulfill my Kickstarter. Hey Pete, last stream you mentioned you knew professional artists who started out later in life. Do you know any of them off the top of your head? Um, 
Well, I did a podcast with a guy, Sam Flegel. He started in his 30s. He's been a professional artist for many years. I'm trying to think of who else started late in life. I used to think I started late in life because I I, um, I didn't start drawing until I was like 16. Everybody else around me said they started drawing when they were like a kid. Oh, uh, Lori Lee Brom is a great example. She's Gerald Brom's wife, so she was art adjacent for many, many years. And then after her kids were grown, she started work as a um, uh, fine artist. She started a career as a fine artist and now she does a bunch of gallery shows and stuff and her husband comes along and nobody knows who he is. <laughs> Even though he's like, used to be like uh, one of the most famous fantasy artists in the world. Now he's just like the, the tag along husband on these gallery events. Yeah, Brahms and Gerald Brahm is a major influence of mine. And so it was very cool to see uh, Lori Lee develop her own brand like so late in life. She had, you know, refined her sense of taste and her identity so much over the years and then finally once like life allowed her to jump into it, was able to apply that into like a uh, full on art career very quickly. Like within a couple of years I think it was, maybe even less. Hayao Miyazaki didn't make Nazca until he was 32. There you go. David Lynch didn't make Eraserhead until he was 27, 28. I mean, 27, 28 is when people make their first movie, right? Kim was asking Pete, would it be okay for me to ask you a lot of annoying logistics questions in the future about this stuff? Yes, it's totally fine. People that I know on the internet, especially, have feel free to DM me with questions about like, can you tell me how you do or warehousing in order fulfillment? Um, I was on a call with a famous artist recently and I was like, you're still shipping orders out of your house? Oh, thanks for the prime sub points, Eddie. And I was like, oh my God, dude, we gotta get you. We gotta get you hooked up. <laughs> you gotta get you warehousing services, holy shit. I'm, I'm always game for answering questions for people about like business stuff because it's always oh, it's such a bear like the it really does just make you feel like a huge idiot for even having to ask how to do especially when it's like basic stuff like I'm trying to set up my web store like what do I need to do you know what services do I use where do I buy packaging how do I do this thing you see other people do it and you just like I don't know. There's this resistance to when I ask people how they did it. I found that artists are like generally incredibly um, generous when it comes to sharing information about like, hey, how did you build that? Where did you buy that? Stuff like that. They tend to just like give you the answer without any resistance whatsoever. There's very little that's being kept as sort of proprietary information among illustrators at least. So if you see anybody ever that is like up to something and you want to like know how they did it, just try to DM them. It's usually not a bother. I find it's really satisfying to be able to help people past all the points where they're stuck. It's especially if it's literally just like dropping them a URL. Be like, go here, check it out. I'm not sure if we both lost track of time or it's uh, we're at two hours, 13 minutes. Two hours, 13 minutes. Oh, well, that's because I had 15 minutes of boot up time at the beginning of the thing. This is like two hours of stream here. I need to do these hands at the very least if I'm going to call this thing done. And then I can get back to Blasphemous for a little bit. I got other shit to do today. Real stuff. Business stuff. I got a Kickstarter launching in five days and i haven't told anybody it's even happening vortex pd thank you so much for the prime sub damn we are almost there 92 out of 100 we only need eight more if you guys have any loose prime subs laying around feel free to drop them on me we only need a few more we got this thing sewn up i 
I feel like paellas shouldn't take this long. I feel like paellas are one of those things that can take cook as fast or slow as you need them to. Lido Studios, getting it, the free Prime sub. You're paying for Prime anyway. Pay me with them Bezos bucks. Use Jeffrey Kisses' as money. Big Hoochie with the Prime sub. You guys are getting it. Thank you so much for feeling the love today. Golden Leaf, we got a, we got a fucking sub train going. I think this might be some of the most like individual subbers we've ever had on the stream today. Very encouraging. So then I guess I have to ask who's going to be next on the, the sub train. Enjoy my last Prime sub. Never, re never really order from any Amazon, so I canceled it. Oh, man, I ordered. I'm like, I'm living that Amazon lifestyle. We got on Prime when we started ordering diapers with the first kid, and then we just never gave up. Too sweet at prime shipping. God, I can't believe I was just basically doing an advertisement for Amazon. Never mind. <laughs> Never mind what I just said. <laughs> Fuck those guys. <laughs> oh yeah, and they also own Twitch, but I mean, Twitch is cool. <laughs> Joined the Discord server yesterday. I've been looking around. Been following your work for a while, Pete. Thank you so much, Big Hoochie. Yeah, the um, I think that I'm really proud of the Discord. I mean, like we were looking at the numbers on Monday, Dustin and I, and we're like, damn, like people seem to be really liking this Discord. It seems to like actually be getting real use. We're really proud of it, having built a space that people actually want to hang out and use. We're trying. It's like really encouraging for us to want to like do our best. Hello? Official Amazon artist. That's me. I'm the official Amaz artist for Amazon.com. That's what I'm doing here. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. The Prime sub train is, is continuing. Steady a new record. Keep going until the clock runs out. What? <laughs> is this a thing that just pops up because of Streamlabs? Did you guys trigger this by being super generous today, or is this something Dustin turned on? It's built into Twitch? Oh shit, so there's, if we're gonna keep the hype train going, somebody's gonna have to sub in the next two minutes and 20 seconds. That's funny. These people know what they're doing. That's marketing genius right there. Cause like now I don't want to see it run down without somebody getting it. But I don't get to choose, you know, it's up to you guys. Yeah, Fijoto's an awesome illustrator, but I mean, he's I, his main job is graphic designer. It's um, it's a really common transition I've seen people do. I know a lot of people say they want to build a freelance art career, but most of the people I know who are in the situation that you're in, Big Hoochie, uh, what they really want is they want an indie artist career. Get the money off of Patreon, make your own personal paintings, take it out on the road a little bit, sell at some shows. Maybe you get a few commissions here or there with the recognition, but like 
Uh, most of the artists I know, that, especially ones that have done sort of a late in life career switch, are so much more satisfied by doing their personal work than by going and doing commission work. But feel free to correct me. <laughs> Kim's like spitting over here on freelance. Hey, hey, Kim, there's a lot of good artists that like freelance, okay? Just because we're weirdos and we insist on constantly doing personal paintings. Andreas, yep. With a T1, not even with a prime sub, coming in and keeping the hype train rolling. Oh, it doesn't reset. We've got 11 seconds. We're not going to hit it. We can't hit it. Not in 10 seconds. I really appreciate like the huge sub train going today, guys. This is this is fun. I came in here talking about how tired, beat up, incapable I was today. And I'm going to be coming out of this thing with a huge smile on my face. Thanks to you guys. Go to conventions, sell prints, t-shirts, and stickers. Maybe do some commissions, but overall I want to do my own thing. Hell yeah. That's indie. Freelance is like, oh, I wait for a company to come tell me what to draw. You know? And it's like, indie is like, I make personal paintings. I, I build a little bit of a fan base. I take it out to shows. I sell my own art. I know freelance is like in the vernacular is thinking like, you know, somebody who does their own thing doesn't really have a real day to day. But I feel like we've got this real distinction going these days between freelance and indie. And like, it's when I, I whenever somebody who's like um, asking me about what I do, whenever they say, oh, so you, you're freelance. I, I, I know it's rude, but I'm always like, no. No, I'm not freelance. I'm not freelance. I don't do freelance, okay? I'm indie. I'm an independent content creator. I'm an Instagram influencer, all right? You wouldn't call Kim Kardashian a freelancer. Feels a bit weird being 41 and starting this late. You're not the only one, I swear to God. Like even in our community, and we've got kind of like a, an intimate community still, Fajoto's like very similar position is what you're doing. Yeah, tell you what to draw and then pay you like $800 for a month's work. That to me is, sounds like freelance. Yeah, Dustin's 39. Dust, Dustin, you and I are the same age, right? Different birthdays, but like, uh, we're pretty close in age. We're indie SoundCloud artists. Yeah. I'm sort of the art equivalent of a SoundCloud, a successful SoundCloud rapper. Grime rapper. Yeah, you know, I do mumble, so I think I'd be pretty good at it. I have thought about that. I was pitching I was pitching Ross Draws on doing a rap video. I wanted to do the I wanted to do an artist rap video. This is a bad idea, but I might do it someday anyway. Once I like have no need for money ever again. Once I'm retired. I want to do a rap video where it's like all like a bunch of indie artists who are all kind of on YouTube all get together and do a rap video, like a corny rap video about, you know, trying to act tough, but they're rapping about like art. They're rap rapping about painting in Photoshop. And then Ross draws has a verse that comes up and he just like goes full on about how he loves to murder and how the killing people is the only thing that he cares about. And he's just like super aggressive and really violent <laughs> compared to everybody else. It's like rapping about Photoshop. <laughs> I just keep this, I have this image in my head of Ross Draws just like spitting fucking Freddy Dread lyrics. And, uh, and I just think it's funny every single time. It's sort of like the, it's basically a ripoff of that old uh, Chappelle show skit where he gets Wayne Brady 
where he gets Wayne Brady to be like this super dangerous dude, you know? Is Wayne Brady gonna have to cut a bitch? It's just that, but with Ross Dross. And he doesn't ever, everyone, like, I want, like, somebody to set him up to rhyme with the word color dodge. And instead, he just starts talking about, like, tearing up people's intestines. <laughs> Where he's just talking about burying his enemies, you know? I don't know. I think if it was written good, it would be funny. Uh, people would, ex you know, people expect a certain thing out of certain types of personalities and then, you know, defy those expectations. I thought it'd be good. We'll see. I think it would be fun to do a rap video with a bunch of other artists, regardless of whether or not it turns into something that people think is genuinely good. Like, I think it would just be fun to do like an art rap video. <laughs> I don't feel like I want to go through my whole life without ever, having never produced a rap video. Dustin's also a pretty good music producer too, so he might get roped into this. I also know a couple of artists that can rap. I can't, so I'd have to like, either be a producer on this or I'd have to like, just do some of the most embarrassing rhymes like it have to I don't, I don't know it wouldn't even be like a joke if i came in and i was bad at it dustin you say you're a dabbler about everything biff is good though biff is really good but i mean he's he's focused on metal experienced dabbler you're you're definitely a pro a uh, gear acquirer you're a pro collector of professional gear dude british people trying to sound badass and rap is a whole genre there is a lot of that going on around these days Scroobius Pip. <laughs> that's a good. It's a good rap name. Uh, these. I'm like. I'm ready to be done with this, and yet I have. There are. There are so many fingers left to paint here. And being so careful and precise with all the edges in this one. And now I need to like draw some decent hands, and not let it get out of control. And I'm. It's bumming me out. <laughs> I'm like, I really just gotta like put on my discipline hat here. I gotta be a good artist for like just a couple minutes, get these hands done. Hmm. Scroobius Pip. There was a time in YouTube history where music was like kind of like the hack for getting views because um, the way the algorithm worked was that like videos that referenced other videos got a boost, but also videos that were music related got a boost. So people who are doing like rap beefs all ended up with like huge, huge boosts in the algorithm. And that's where you ended up with like the Paul brothers and stuff doing all these like dumb rap beef and like them just releasing like music video after music video because it like boosted their numbers so crazy big. And that's where you got like PewDiePie doing like rap videos and stuff. I'm pretty sure that those days have passed us. So it's like, 
It's not like a good idea from like a brand building perspective to make a rap video full of artists, but they just, it feels like a thing that hasn't happened yet. Maybe I'm not clued in, but like the, you, the YouTube artist community has not, the artist YouTube community has not banded together to make an embarrassing rap video that they're all going to regret in 10 years. And I feel like the world's poorer for it. Now it's boxing. Uh, I have gone to at least one influencer boxing event in person. So yeah, maybe. David Lynch. <laughs> Me and David Lynch are the same molecules. I mean, that's, I'm sure that's technically true. Who would I box? I don't know. I'm like, I, I I would need a lot of time to train. And then again, I saw that the, when I went to go to uh, Creator Clash 1, I gotta say, some of those guys, they looked like they were in about as good shape as me. Um, I'm trying to think, who would I box? Like from the artist community, who would I box or like? We have shrimp posture. Listen, I know plenty of artists that are in shockingly good shape. That like, they're like, oh, I just wanna be able to use myself as a reference. So I'm gonna spend 10 years sculpting my body like a piece of art. You haven't met those kinds of people? They're around. I've always thought like, yeah, I should be one of those people. That looks awesome. I would love to be like super sculpted and jacked and stuff and be able to be like, oh yeah, I look like one of my paintings or whatever. Instead, people are always like, wow, you don't look anything like your art. <laughs> Which I think is funny, but maybe not ideal. Maybe not ideal. I'm trying to think, I, I, I don't, who would I want to box? Cause like, I don't think it would be because of a beef. I think if I was gonna wanna box somebody because we had a friendly, we, we it was a friendly experience that we're both gonna like get excited for like being in a friendly contest, right? Get all beefcake and then Anya, and then Anya will do her first watercolor of you. <laughs> She'll do, I'll be like laying on my side with one leg up, you know, like jet that famous Jeff Goldblum image with him with his shirt open and it'll all be done by in watercolor by Anya maybe yeah I think if I was going to do celebrity box if I was going to do artist boxing I would want to do it with somebody who I really liked rather than somebody who I had a beef with because I wouldn't want to like just use this as an excuse to like hit somebody who I had problems with I would really want to have it be something that I like. Um, was still like a feel good experience for everyone involved, you know? I'd also probably lose. So it would just be like, if I was just gonna like get into a ring with somebody who I didn't like and have them beat the shit out of me, that wouldn't be, <laughs> wouldn't be a very good experience at all. <laughs> I'm gonna lose this fight. So the question isn't who would I fight? The question is who would I lose to in public? Who would I like to lose to in public? I would fight Tim. I would fight, I would fight Von Art. I think Von Art and I fighting would be really fun because neither of us have ever been in particularly great shape. He doesn't, he's like vegan also, so he's like frail. <laughs> he's definitely in better shape than me right now though, but he, he's not like a, he's not like a very tough guy. And so I feel like our, are both of us have a little bit of a beta nature that I think would make for a, a good matchup back and forth. Though I think he's, yeah. Ross would, Ross would be able to nail it. I mean, Ross, Ross would be great. He's in great shape. I think Tim and I would be a really good matchup because I really like Tim. And I think that like, I'm like taller than him. 
Um, and I might be a, I might be slightly stronger than him, but he's I'm like so much fatter than him <laughs> that like he's probably got more wind than I do. Like he wouldn't get worn down as fast as I would. So I think he'd have a really good shot at walking away with this. Like I think he would probably dance around me and beat the shit out of me in the ring. But I would I getting getting my ass beat on stage by the gayest guy I know would I would still find to be a pretty good time if it was me and Tim boxing. I would do it. And he loves pageantry. Tim loves his pageantry. So he would get to like do it as like a big old like dress up thing. If he could come into stay uh, up like his entrance in picking out his entrance music and his, his trunks and all that. And if he could like have like a costume he came out into the ring in, I think he would have a blast doing it. Tim would put on a hell of a show as a part of like getting into the ring for sure. So I'm, I I'm definitely would go with him if I was going to box somebody. He was saying how he wanted to be on here a little bit more, so he might be coming back on, on Friday. First true face reveal. <laughs> I have so much uh, content with my face out there on the internet already that it would be, yeah, it would be my, my re-face reveal. It would be me getting it punched by Tim. What about a variation of chess boxing where it's art boxing, where you do a daily study and then you box? I'm into it. Yes, I would do it. I think that <laughs> I'm surprised nobody's done like chess boxing, but for like Smash Brothers, where they do like they do like some sort of video game tournament, but then they also like stop the turn the video game tournament to do boxing. <laughs> like, I like this idea of like life drawing that is also a boxing event. I think that's a good one. Am I done? Am I done? I'm close to done. Very close to done. I was going to do a little bit more with the soft light layer. This is one of the things I've been doing a lot of recently, is like kind of trying to finish things off with the soft light layer at the end. Do a little bit of color palette unification, a little bit of like background texture. Push the values around one final time just to get a little bit of nuance, additional nuance in there. Did Ludwig do smash boxing? Shit. I figured if anyone was going to do it, he would have done it, but I didn't... I don't know. I don't pay that close attention to what Ludwig does. I like Mogul Mail, but I don't really pay that close attention to him. add any smears either. I didn't lose any edges here. Okay, so uh, I've got this and then I have more than enough opportunity to add some lost edges here with these like weird bright get a little bit of glow going on. Oh, you find your aid person. Okay. A Wanix. I 
thank you. Let me just... Mm, I try to move this hair strand and I, I feel like I fucked it up. Hoochie's got a cool question here. What's a Photoshop tip that forever changed your life? Photoshop tip that forever changed my life. I'd say the biggest one that comes to mind off the top of my head is to, well, there's two, the two big ones are like both from co -work, former coworkers I had. One of them was the guy who's like, oh yeah, you should just start your pictures in black and white and then um, use hard light to glaze in color. <laughs> And then the other one was like, hey, have you ever heard of this other coworker was like, hey, have you ever heard of gradient maps? Phil Hale vibes. Oh, I totally feel you on that. Yeah. I love Phil Hale and like the sort of like really extreme body pose with the flat blue background and then the like high contrast lighting, definitely in the Phil Hale zone. I don't know why I'm I'm just playing around to see if it makes sense for me to like finish off with some of these faux kind of brushy brush strokes as opposed to like um you know the sort of softer edge ones that I get from like my usual brush finish you know or something like this that's like a little bit more painty scrapey I think I'm getting a little too much sponge finish in the back here. I'm just gonna push this down a little bit and I'm gonna call it done. I like the overall, I'm, I'm finished. <laughs> I'm satisfied with this thing. Uh, and I just wanna make sure that I, I'm not leaving any large tool marks at the end that I'm gonna look at later and go like, damn, that would have taken two seconds to clean up. Trying to add things at the end that are like, feel like loose, careless brush marks, but then ultimately just leave like a big Photoshop brush stamp in it that doesn't feel natural at all is like, uh, you know, something I really wanna try to avoid. So I'm just gonna spend like a minute going through and making sure that like the loose brushy marks that I make feel a little bit intentional and not too like random all over the place.
used to manually change colors constantly. Dang. That's that's what I always figured painting was when I was first getting into Photoshop. And then once I figured out how to like kind of build a color palette and then just use the alt key, like that's when I feel like this whole thing kind of broke open for me and started to really make tons of sense. Just, this is all looking a little washed out and like I want to get that richness, that skin tone back in there a little bit and also unify it a little bit too. Then we'll see what the miracle has for us. Wait, wait, wait. Is it done? Let me just brush the face a little bit here. Whatever I was doing with those like final finishing marks, not 100% there. I don't want to go crazy on the face. The face is like turned away, so incidental. I just want to Have what little there is that's there feel intentional. Okay, now it's done. Man, it is. I'm discovering that it is so much slower to do these on stream than it is. When I've been doing a few of them, I thought I had really busted open something new. I was like, this new workflow of mine is producing better studies and faster. And it's been incredible. And then I was like, I'm gonna see what happens when I take this back on a stream. And then I go ahead and I do it on stream and I'm at like two and a half hours. And I'm like, that's an entire hour longer than the other ones that I was doing before. The other ones, I was like, I had myself timed. It was 90 minutes, I was perfect. And I was like, okay, I got it from two and a half hours down to 90 minutes. I can do this thing in 20 minutes. That's what I was saying earlier. And now I'm like, no, it's because I'm streaming. It's like way harder to paint on stream. <laughs> this is me like with my Goku, in my Goku like gravity chamber, doing like fucking weighted push-ups on the spaceship on my way out to the alien planet. Damn. Imagine if you do a master copy in two hours, fucking Skrilla. Yeah, I know, right? If only I could do an incredible work really fast, then I would definitely make tons of money doing it somehow, figure it out. But um, let's see. Any, anything we got to touch before we get out of here? Uh, thanks to everyone who signed up for my mentorship. Uh, I'm really excited to get this thing started. First class is on the 21st. If you missed out and you want to do my mentorship class, go ahead to huckleberry.art slash mentorships. Addict, thanks for raiding. I'm logging out. <laughs> We're about to raid somebody else right now. I'm going to pull up their stream right now and get it past the, uh, the ads here. Let's see. Get a fresh window. French raid. Oh, what's my, f what's my favorite French word? Croissant. So we're gonna raid a Wanix right now. I'll be in there. Oh, this is perfect. Study stream, just getting going. Wow, this guy looks, oh, this girl looks good. Hell yeah. Perfect. All right. Let's go say hi to a Wanix. Ad break. Thanks everyone for joining me today. Thanks everyone who subbed today. Huge sub day. And um, I'll see you guys on the other side. See you on Friday.